My name is Tyler, and uh, I'll be bringing the word tonight. Pastor Jeremy is our youth pastor. He's on his one-year anniversary uh, in, he said, yes, that's awesome. Hopefully he's watching and he can see you guys clapping for him. I'm sure that would mean so much to his little heart. Actually, it's not a little heart. It's a very big heart. It's a very big-hearted person. So they're in the Grand Canyon right now, which is pretty amazing, pretty cool. Uh, but I am super excited about tonight, and I just wanted to kind of start out by telling you guys that I had a different message planned for tonight, and I'm going to tell you the title, but don't take it seriously because I'll explain it in a second. It's kind of weird, but uh, it's just the way my mind works. And so it's not the message I'm going to speak, but I was so excited about the title and, and you know, the beginning of it that I have to just talk about it really fast before I go into my actual message that I feel like God wanted to say tonight. My message that I was going to speak before was a message, a uh, very inspiring message entitled uh, Strangle Yourself. And I had this big strangle yourself message about how, you know, you, you are supposed to strangle your flesh not in a physical, actual way, but, you know, cut off the flesh in your life, cut off the world in your life. I was going to make a bunch of Jeffrey Epstein jokes. It was going to be amazing, but I didn't get to it, and so I'm very sorry. But I do have a great message tonight. I'm very excited to speak. Is anybody excited to hear the Word of God tonight? Amen. Amen. Now, there is, this has just happened this morning, okay? This just happened this morning. I'm actually the kids pastor here at the church, and so... We were in, we had probably three or four first-time guests in our kids' ministry, in our second service, kids' ministry service. And they were just kind of nuts. Have you guys ever been around a kid that's just like a little bit just nuts? Yeah. Point at Madeline. Every, <laughs> I see a couple people pointing at their kids. That's funny. Yeah, this, these kids are just kind of a little bit off the chain. Like they're just kind of just a little bit more wired than everybody else. You know what I mean? <laughs> they, they will, they're the kind of kids that actually bounce off of walls. It's not like a figure of speech. It's like kids that actually bounce off of walls. It's like insane. And these kids were just kind of running around and just being crazy and being loud and being distracting. And it was kind of hard to wrestle them in. It's like wrestling a greasy pig. Um, you know, we didn't physically do that. But, you know, it felt like at times it was necessary. But we didn't have to actually resort to that, which is wonderful. But there was this one kid, and he was probably like this tall. And he had blonde hair, and he was probably six years old. What did you say, six? Six? Five, six? Three, five? Eight? Oh my gosh, this makes it so much worse. This is an eight-year-old. Okay, so he walks into the kids' room, and what we do in the beginning of our service is we play a bunch of games, and it's a lot of fun. And so we start out with this game, and this kid doesn't get picked. And, and immediately, he walks in the room, he seems like he's just in a good mood, and immediately he doesn't get picked to play this game, and he just goes... <sighs> and he just sits there looking like somebody lit a fuse under his butt, and it's about to explode through his mouth, and he's just going to start screaming. I mean, it was insane. And so he finally, you know, I'm sure somebody saw that, and they were like, I, we should probably pick him to play. And so they thought that would solve all the problems. And so the next game came along, and they picked it like, yes, you, sir, yes, you calm gentlemen. Please come up, please come forward and play this wonderful game. Yes, and remain calm, please, for the rest of us. And so he comes up, and he's all happy, and he plays this game, and he loses, and um, it made it worse. And so he's, I just walked in. This is the point where I walked in. The rest of this is hearsay. I saw this with my own eyes. He is, he's, he loses this game, and as soon as he takes his blindfold off, it was like pin the tail on the donkey type of something, but it was like pin the, f t you know, tail feather on the turkey or something weird. I don't know. It was nice. But they took the blindfold off, and he saw that it wasn't anywhere near his target, and he just... And he sits down, and he just freaks out. This kid starts screaming. He starts crying. He is weeping. It's like his whole world fell apart. I mean, he's got his hands in his face, and I'm like, this is insane. So I walk over to his chair, and I just sit next to him, and he's just, I'm just trying to talk to him, and every answer to my question is, Bruh! You know when you're, somebody's like really worked up that they don't give you logical answers, they don't actually say words, just go, Bruh! What's the matter, buddy? What'd you say? Bruh! Well, you know, you, you don't have to pout like this because you lost the game. You'll have more chances to win candy, you know, at the end of service. <laughs> and he just does these weird things, and he wouldn't say words, and it was really hard to get him to calm down. But he just had this idea that he was, like, entitled to play and win every game. Like, that we would rig the whole service for him. This is what I felt like was going through his mind. Like, he was intentionally coming to this kid's service. Like, we were just going to rig the whole service around this kid's intentions. And that we were just going to let him win everything. And that he just deserved this and he deserved that. He had this, just this entitlement mentality. And he would just freak out. This happened like three or four times. It was a little bit crazy. And it he kind of reminded me as me as a child. And I'm not proud of this. But I did earn myself a nickname when I was about, uh, gosh, 
probably about seven or eight years old, I earned myself a nickname with my stepdad. My, my stepdad adopted me at the age of seven with my mom, and so we moved together, and I don't know if anybody here has, like, step-parents, but sometimes you butt heads, especially, like, a father and a son. We were really butting heads a lot, and so it was kind of hard to get along, and so one of these days, it was probably, like, eight or nine years old, I would just remember I earned the nickname Ape Boy, and the reason that he nicknamed me Ape Boy is because when I didn't get my way, I would start to make the same sounds that kid was making. <laughs> I would just make these weird sounds. You know, I wouldn't like pop my chest and do gorilla stuff or anything, but you know, I did, I would just go up to my room, I'd slam the doors and I'd just grunt and groan and just cry. And, and I was just this entitled little kid who had just been disappointed and just frustrated and angry all the time. And I just don't, I don't know why uh, that I was like that. It was just, it was awful. I had this entitlement mentality where if I didn't get my way, I just freaked out and it earned me a, a very reputable nickname, Ape Boy. And if my brother was here, he would tell you, yes, it's absolutely true. And so I remember the first time he called me Ape Boy, I was setting up this, I remember this vividly, vividly. it was like the most scarring moment of my life. Like it, it almost replaced my name. It's like he could have changed it on my birth certificate. And that's just my reaction. And so I'm standing at the top of the stairs and my dad is kind of laughing at me. I'm really mad. You have ever have somebody laugh at you when you're mad? Don't do that. Don't know what's gonna happen. It's crazy. It's not smart. It's, I mean, it's, it's funny for you, the one that's laughing, but for the other person, it's very, very, and so I was standing there at the top of the stairs and my dad's laughing at my reaction to, to me getting in trouble and to me stomping my feet and making these grunty noises. And I was just like, and when he laughed, I just got louder and I got more obnoxious and he called me Ape Boy and he told me to go to my room. Well, almost fell off. He told me, he called me Ape Boy and he told me to go to my room and it would just, I was just like, oh, and my brothers called me Ape Boy and everybody was downstairs. And then I remember to get out of trouble, I wrote a note on a paper airplane. I threw it downstairs to my mom and dad and I peeked around the corner saying, I'm sorry and I love you. And it got me out of trouble, which is great. But that is my childhood. Uh, for, the, for the most part, I was a very angry child. They called me Ape Boy. But for those of you who know me now, thank God I am no longer like that. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. But it was this, this whole idea was that I wasn't, I wasn't really grateful. I, wasn't, I was just had this entitlement thing where if I didn't get my way, it was just the end of the world. Like I thought I deserved everything. And there's so many people, I feel like in this generation especially, that have this entitlement mentality, that just feel like I was born with certain rights and if you violate them, I'm just gonna lose it. I was born with, it, with, a, with a right to have this, 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 and this, and it's this, 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 and this, and they have this long list of things that they're entitled to, this long list of things that they feel that they deserve just for being born on this world. And so it's, it's a really terrible mentality to have. And the problem with the entitlement mentality is that entitlement is the enemy of a grateful heart. And you know, Thanksgiving is coming up and I decided, you know, oh gosh, my shoes untied now. Yeah, but it's going to be. It's like, I can tell. <sighs> we'll figure that out later. <clears throat> Entitlement, you know, Thanksgiving is coming up, and I decided, you know, I really feel like it would be good to talk about Thanksgiving in kind of a different, twisty kind of a way. And so the entitlement mentality is an enemy of the grateful heart. Now, if you're going to be a thankful person, you cannot be entitled. Amen? If, you're, if you want to be a grateful, a thankful person, like the Bible tells us to be, like, like I believe that we should, especially in America... You know, if we want to be thankful people, we cannot be entitled. We can't just think that we walk around deserving everything. We're supposed to be thankful that we have anything at all. You know, and so that's how it kind of conflicts and it kind of rubs against each other. Entitlement is the mindset that says, I have a right to something that I want. I deserve privilege and special treatment. But you cannot give thanks with an entitled heart. An entitled heart is a heart filled with pride. It's not an attitude of humility. It's an attitude of ungratefulness. And so, although I believe that having this type of mindset is just not in general, a very good way to live. I think it's even more poisonous to our relationship with God, to our spiritual life. Because it, if, if anybody has been, like, around Jesus long enough, you know that you just don't deserve anything from him. You guys know what I'm talking about? Like, when I first got saved, when I first received Jesus into my heart, I remember coming to the altar, and I was just crying because I'm like, how could he love me? How could I, how could I deserve this? And the fact is that I didn't deserve it. And you feel so dirty at times, you know, because you're looking at how holy he is and how beautiful he is, how perfect and pure and loving he is. And you compare yourself with him and it's just like, oh, and you know, and he wants you to let, you know, let him in, but it's hard because you feel like, you know, I don't deserve this, but that's the whole point. It's the whole point of the gospel is that we don't deserve it, but he gives us what he deserves and not what we deserve. And so it's poisonous to our relationship with God. The Bible says that God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. 
and all this is just to kind of set the stage for this message. It doesn't have a whole lot to do with what I'm about to talk about, but I think it's important to make sure that we check ourselves really quick to make sure that we don't have this entitlement mindset because the rest of this message is basically about what God has given us and what we choose to do with it. And so if we don't understand what God has given us is a gift and not something we deserve, not something that we have earned, we're never going to get anywhere. So I can't move forward until we all understand that nothing from God is an entitled thing. Nothing from God is something that we deserve. Nothing from God is, is anything we could ever earn or anything we could trade him out for. It's all by grace. It's all by grace. Amen? Amen. And so I want to set the stage. This is important to know. And I know that there are rewards for good works, but without Jesus' obedience that brought him to, to, death on, to death on a cross, we'd have no opportunity to even earn rewards. We'd have no opportunity to even serve him. We'd have no opportunity to even live this life. You know what I mean? And so there's this beautiful scripture, is Philippians uh, chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, and it talks about how Jesus was God. I'm going to read it in a second, but it talks about how Jesus is God, and, and it basically what I got from this verse is that Jesus is the only one who could have lived an entitled lifestyle, and nobody would, could really say anything about it, because he actually does deserve the world. You know, he, he kind of does, he's perfect, he's holy, he's everything that we're not, and so he's the only one that could be entitled, but the Bible says this about him. He says, he existed in the form of God, yet he gave no thought to seizing equality with God as his supreme prize. And, I, and this is kind of like an asterisk. It's, it said, when I was reading this, it said that it's, he didn't see equality with God as something to be exploited. He didn't see it when he came to earth. He didn't see that because he was the son of God that he was going to march around like this. And he was going to have servants following him around and feeding him grapes and fanning him like you see, you know, royalty. He's di he didn't walk around entitled like that. He didn't see it as something to be exploited. But it says, instead, he emptied himself of his outward glory by reducing himself to the form of a lowly servant. He became human. He humbled himself and became vulnerable, choosing to be reveal revealed as a man and was obedient. He was a perfect example, even in his death, a criminal's death by crucifixion. Not even Jesus chose to be entitled. He did not see equality with God as something to be exploited, as something to be used. And I think if any one of us were in his position, we would be like kind of marching around expecting everything to be handed to us, right? And we kind of see that already. But, it, you know, Jesus laid down his divinity, the Bible says. It empty, he emptied himself of his outward glory, and he humbled himself. And he didn't, if anybody is going to be the one that we follow, it should be him. We should be his example. And so let's follow his example in that. But there's this verse that I want to focus on tonight for the most part, and it's a short verse. It's Psalm uh, 16, verse 5. It says, O Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance. Everybody say inheritance. And my cup. Everybody say cup. You maintain my lot. That part's, you know, not relevant to the message, but it's obviously it's the word of God, so it's beautiful. Amen. One clap. Psalm 16, verse 5. You are the portion of my inheritance. Say inheritance and my cup. Say cup. And so there's two things that stuck out to me in this verse. It's inheritance and it's cup. It's inheritance and it's cup. And so I kind of broke this down and I studied it. And I just found that there was something really interesting that I found as a common theme through the Bible. This is kind of a really practical message. Does anybody want a practical, practical message sometimes? Something that they can just take and something that's going to actually transform the way that they live. You know, I like to do that kind of stuff. And so there's these two parts. is my inheritance and my cup. Say my inheritance and my cup. We're going to start with the inheritance part. The definition of an inheritance is, well, this is my definition. I looked up the definition. It's not like I changed it or anything, but this is kind of the way that I like to word it. It's an inheritance is something given to you simply because of proximity to the person giving it. So I have no right to Steve's mom's inheritance, do I? Do I? Well, praise the Lord. Maybe i got to pick a different person. Well, I'm not going to say anything more. I don't have a right to Steve's mom's inheritance. Why? It's because I'm not his brother. I'm not her daughter, we think. I'm not sure yet. The tests are still out, you know. But, uh, you know, there's a difference in complexion here, but I, I think we could be brothers. Um, but I don't think I have, a, I don't have a right to somebody else's father's inheritance because of my proximity. I'm not family. We might be the closest friends ever, but it doesn't matter how close of friends we are, I'm not entitled to their inheritance because I am not in the same proximity they are to their own parents. Does that make sense? And so there's like this earthly kind of form of an inheritance. But when my parents pass away, there's going to be things that are handed to me simply because of my relationship to my mother and my father. Now, obviously, they could change that, and I hope they don't because I think I'm a pretty good kid. But, you know, we'll leave that to them to decide. What do you say? Anyways, so I, 
you know, I have an entitlement, not necessarily an entitlement, but I have a right to my parents' inheritance because of my proximity to them. Does that make sense? So, but there's a Bible inheritance too. There's a spiritual inheritance that the Bible talks about that God wants to give us as well. So it's not just a, it, it's not just an earthly thing that we talk about with money and houses and cars and that kind of stuff, physical things. The Bible says that there's a spiritual inheritance. It's something that our Father in heaven has given us, not because we deserve it, but simply because of our proximity to Him, simply because we've been brought near to God through the blood of Christ, simply because we are now His adopted children. Amen. That's amazing. We do not deserve it, but it's simply because Jesus did what He did. Now we're brought here, we're grafted in, we're adopted as sons and daughters, and now we can call Him Father. It's pretty amazing. And so He's got this inheritance to give to us simply because we're His children. And so in Hebrews, it talks about how this spiritual inheritance works. This is a little bit of a long, this, this is probably, probably about, this is eight verses. It's super, super good. So I want you guys to read this along with me on the screen. I don't know if we have the right translation because I messed this up, but Sarah's the best, so we'll see if she got it. Uh, it says this, Hebrews 9, 15 verses, excuse me, Hebrews 9, verses 15 through 23. It says, that is why the he, which is Jesus, is the one who mediates a new covenant between God and his people so that all who are called can receive the internal inheritance God has promised to them. For Christ died to set them free from the penalty of the sins they had committed under the first covenant. So here we are to kind of establish what we've got so far. We've got this first covenant that is before Jesus, and Jesus came to this world to establish a new covenant, which is basically an agreement. This is, an, this is a new form of how we're going to relate to God and how we can actually be one and have a relationship with Jesus and have a relationship to our Father. And so he's established this new covenant, but this is what it goes on to say. It says, now when someone leaves a will, it is necessary to prove that the person who made the will is dead because the will goes into effect only after the person's death. That makes sense, right? You know, if somebody's going to leave a will, you don't access that will until they pass away. And so once they pass away, now all of a sudden this will is made accessible and now it's automatically handed down into your account. It's pretty cool. So while the person who has made it is still alive, the will cannot be put into effect. That is why even the first covenant was put into effect with the blood of an animal. For after Moses had re read each of God's commandments to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats along with water and sprinkled both the book of God's law and all the people using hyssop branches and scarlet wool. Then he said, this blood confirms the covenant God has made with you. And in the same way, he sprinkled blood on the tab tabernacle and on everything used for worship. In fact, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with blood. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. That's a very powerful verse. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. That is why the tabernacle and everything in it, which were copies of things in heaven, had to be purified by the blood of animals. But the real things in heaven had to be purified with far better sacrifices than the blood of animals. And the far better sacrifice is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He did something that no other person could do. He did something that no animal could be sacrificed for. He did something that there's only one person who could have done what he did, and he was the only one who could do it. He's the one that chose to lay down his life to establish this new covenant with us. And so what this is basically saying is that this is not an inheritance that we're entitled to because the Bible says that we were actually enemies of God. It says while we were still sinners, Jesus died on the cross for us. He was crucified for us. We were enemies of God when he sent Jesus to bring us into his family. And that right there is why Christians should be the most grateful people on the face of the planet. More than the rich the richest of the rich people in this world, we as Christians, no matter how poor we are, should be the most grateful people, the most thankful people on the face of the earth. Because we have something so much greater than anything this world could ever offer us. We have an eternal covenant, the Bible says, an eternal inheritance. And it's something that we don't have to earn. It's something that we don't have to do things for. It's something that was given to us purely by the grace and the love of God. And so in this inheritance is the sum total of all that God has promised us in salvation. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, it says this. This is what it says about our inheritance in Christ, just to kind of show you how amazing this is. It says that grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything. Everybody say everything. Everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him, 
who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. So basically what it's saying is the power of this inheritance, this thing that God our Father is handing down to us, the power that's in it, what is really in it for us, all wrapped up in a nutshell, is that the power is to change us and to make us like Jesus. And that is an insanely powerful power. Because I don't know about you guys, but changing is very difficult. Changing is not something that's really easy to do, but there's power in these things that God has given us. Ephesians says that God has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. He's given us every spiritual blessing in heaven. All spiritual blessings on heaven. That's pretty amazing. And these promises and these blessings are given to us not so that we can squander this. And to kind of, you know, it's not like money that we can just spend on things that we want. It's to change us from the inside out. It's to change us and make us more like our Father. It's to change us and make us more like Jesus inside and out. And so that's kind of what that inheritance is like. And the second part is my cup. Now, this is the part that I was really excited about. Before I get too excited, I have to take a drink because I just want to take a drink of water. <laughs> the elongated sip. That was great. <clears throat> so there are many references to cups in the Bible. But the reference in Psalm 16, verse 5, which is the verse that we read, I'll read it again just to kind of remind us. It says, O Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. And that word cup kind of struck me in a different way than I've seen it in other ones. You know, normally what the word cup represents in the Bible is kind of like a destiny. When Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, Lord, let this cup, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. What is he talking about? His experience that he's about to have of death on the cross, of this torture and this terrible, you know, thing that he's about to endure. So he's saying, let this cup, let this destiny, let this thing that's about to happen to me pass from me if it's possible. But he says something after it's very, very powerful. It's kind of like the filter to all prayer. It says, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And it's kind of funny because when I pray, if I pray for something that I'm not 100% sure that God actually wants me to have, I'll always like, I'll pray, I'll pray, and I'll pray, and I'll pray, and then I'll be like, okay, this is the safety net to everything I could ever say. If I prayed for something really stupid that would really get me in a lot of trouble, I can say at the end, but nevertheless, let your will be done, not mine. I call it the safety net to my prayers because sometimes they get weird, right? And so... I read about this, this cup in this commentary. Now commentary, just to give you kind of a, an overview really quick. Commentary can be really good or com can t commentary can be really off. Okay, it's written by people. This is not like the word of God or anything, but I just want to let you guys know. I love reading commentaries, but it's important to kind of bounce this off of the word of God so that we can make sure we're reading truth. And so this has just struck me in a really beautiful way. It was too good not to read word for word. It says this, O Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. And the way that they define cup is my chosen portion. Everybody say chosen. So we're going to call this the chosen cup. Everybody say the chosen cup. The inheritance is something that's given because of our proximity to God, but the cup is chosen. Okay, so we've got our inheritance that comes from heaven to make us more like Jesus. That is given, but our cup is chosen. Okay, and it says my chosen portion. You maintain my lot. It says the Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup with what confidence and bounding joy does jesus turn to jehovah he's talking about his jesus's relationship to his father and how jesus chose his father he said whom his soul possessed and delighted in content beyond measure with his portion in the lord his god he had not a single desire with which to hunt after other gods his cup was full and his heart was full also even in his sorest sorrows, he still laid hold of his father with both hands. That's a beautiful, that's really good, isn't it? I read that, I was like, oh my gosh. It's just this image of him just grabbing a hold of like the father. And just, it's like with both hands, like not letting go. It says, even in, my sore, even in his sorest sorrows, he still laid hold of his father with both hands. It just shows that Jesus' only desire was to be one with his father. It, it's this picture of Jesus saying, like, I'm going to hold on to you with both hands. I'm not letting go. And no matter what I go through, I'm not going to let you go. I'm just going to pull myself into you. I'm going to pull myself closer to you. I'm not going to let this 
nothing go with you because nothing else can satisfy me. Nothing else is going to do what you can do for me. Nothing else is going to be who you can be for me. Nobody else can love me like you can love me. Nobody else gives me peace like you give me. Nobody else is like you, Jesus. There is none like you in the heaven or on earth. I'm, I'm holding on to you with both hands. It's powerful. It's so powerful. And in this verse, what I felt like God spoke to me is that the inheritance is given, but the cup is chosen. Everybody say, the inheritance is given, but the cup is chosen. This is really good. This is really powerful. And the cup here is what we choose to be satisfied by. I'm going to call it the cup of desire, the cup, the chosen cup of desire. Because I don't know about you guys, but I'm very well aware that we have a, a very strong power to be able to choose what satisfies us. And it's not like it's like a conscious choice, like today I'm going to be satisfied by this and tomorrow I'm going to do this. But it's the way that we live. It's the way that we kind of maintain ourselves. It's the way our habits are formed. And, and it's formed slowly. Our desires are formed slowly. And some things, times it's formed a little bit more quickly. But this cup of desire is something that is chosen by us. It's not something that, that's just given to us. I don't know about you guys, but when you got saved, did all of your worldly desires pass away? Yes? They did. Every single one of your worldly desires passed away. Every, you guys are blessed because that didn't happen for me. I'm telling you, when I got saved, I loved Jesus, and there was, there was a huge change in my life. There's some things that shifted immediately, but there were still some desires in my heart, still some habits that I had from my old life that I was wrestling with for a long time. Nobody else experienced that? That's crazy. Oh, yeah, okay, now I see a couple hands. I just had to explain a little bit. I understand where you're coming from. Grace is holier than everybody. I can say that because she's my wife. She's beautiful. And she's a great example. She's a great example for me. But uh, so I remember when I, got first, when I first got saved, I have this transformation that happens in my life. And I'm like on fire for God. And I raise my hands in worship and I'm singing and I cry a lot. And I read my Bible and I pray. And this is amazing. But there's still these desires that are deep-seated in my heart that I struggled for a long time to change. Because desires aren't something sometimes that kind of shift and break off immediately. Sometimes they're things that you have to wrestle off of you. Sometimes they're, they're heavy chains that you've got to just lift off of you and receive the power of God and the grace of God to get that junk out of your heart. But that's kind of what happened to me. It's, it's the cup of desire. And the problem is that not all of our unhealthy worldly desires are eliminated right when we get saved. Sometimes it's a process of purification. Everybody say purification. And although we have this amazing inheritance with wonderful promises, if our cup isn't filled with the desire for the Lord, it's going to result in ungratefulness. And we see this so clearly. The best example that I found in the whole Bible was the Israelites after they were delivered from slavery and bondage in, uh, in Egypt. Because the Bible says that they were in slavery and bondage to Egypt for 400 years. Now, these people are like harsh slave masters. They're people that... You know, it's stereotypical slavery. Like, they're whipping them. They're making them carry heavy things. They're building things. They don't get breaks, you know. It's, it's some intense slavery, some intense bondage they were through, that they were in for 400 years. And all of a sudden, God raises up Moses to set them free. And so Moses goes, and long story short, God splits the Red Sea. Moses raises his staff. They walk through on dry ground. They celebrate for a minute. And then the Bible says that they immediately start to complain. Here they are set free from bondage, set free from all that junk, but they still have this desire issue in their heart. Because what happens, this is in the book of Numbers, 11, chapter 11, verses 4 through 6, it says, Then the foreign rabble who were traveling with the Israelites began to crave the good things of Egypt. And the people of Israel also began to complain. Oh, for some meat, they exclaimed. We remember the fish that we used to eat for free in Egypt, and we had all the cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions and garlic that we wanted, but now our appetites are gone. All we ever see is this manna. And manna, if you don't know what, the, what the, this passage is talking about, God supernaturally supplied food for them in the wilderness. It says that it came down and rested on the ground, and all they had to do was go out and pick it up. Like God supplied food for them for 40 years, but they were so ungrateful. They would complain. They would get this manna supernaturally, and then after eating it for so long, they'd be like, I'm really tired of this. I'm done with this. Why don't we just go back to Egypt? Why don't we just go back to Egypt? Why don't we just go back to Egypt? Why did we bring, you know, why did you bring us out here to just be bored and, and, you know, and dead and dry and we don't have water and we don't have good food? We had all this great stuff back in our old life, but now here we are. So they had the given inheritance, but they didn't have the chosen cup of desire for the Lord. 
they were given something. They were given so much. The Bible even says in another, in another passage that their shoes and their clothes didn't wear out for 40 years. I go through shoes in like six months. It's one of my biggest irritations. That's why I have these like heavy duty boots on. I wear them every day, like in the winter now. Okay, so their shoes and their, their clothes didn't wear out for 40 years. God had given them so much. Their inheritance was blessing. Their inheritance was freedom from bondage. Their inheritance was all these incredible, amazing things. They had a promised land just ahead, 11 days journey ahead. They spent 40 years in the wilderness because they were ungrateful. Because the Lord chose them, but they didn't choose the Lord. The Lord gave to them, but they didn't give back to the Lord. The Lord gave them his heart, but they didn't give their hearts back to the Lord. Their hearts remained in Egypt. Their bodies in, the, in, their, in this whole group of people was outside and they're in the wilderness, but their hearts, their desires were left in Egypt. They had all this given inheritance. They had all, all these amazing blessings given to them, but when they didn't have their desire was for the Lord, their desire was for the things of Egypt, the desire for us would be the things of our old life, the things that we have no part of anymore. The Bible says, what fellowship does light have with darkness? You know, we are in the kingdom of the son of his love, the Bible says, that we're in a kingdom of light, that we've been brought in by his marvelous grace, that we shouldn't desire the things of the world, that we shouldn't desire the things of darkness, but there's times where we wrestle, and there's times where we act like these Israelites, where they're given so much, but they don't give back. They're, they're just receiving this great inheritance, but because their hearts have not chosen the cup of the desire of the Lord, they are ungrateful and they perished, the Bible says, in the wilderness. That's pretty crazy to have all these amazing things given to them by God, but only because they didn't choose him back. They died in the wilderness. They died with full bellies and somehow remained ungrateful. And the amazing thing is, is that they complained so much and God actually answered some of their complaints. They complained at first for, for water, and that's kind of understandable. I mean, after, you know, you kind of need water. And so they complained about the water, and God made the bitter water sweet. And they complained about not having food, and God gave them manna. They complained about manna, so God gave them meat. The Bible says that quail flew in, and they just landed on the ground, and they just went out and picked it up. I mean, I'm serious. This is what the Bible says. This is crazy, crazy provision. Like, the answer to, the, to their prayers, and they receive it, and their hearts got full, and they forgot God. It's very possible for us to receive the given inheritance of God, be filled by it, and then forget him when we get what we want from him. It's very, very possible, and it happens so often. They were promised overflow, milk and honey, the Bible says. Their chosen cup of desire and delight was filled with Egypt and not with the presence of God. And so... What I want to make sure that we understand is that without purified desires, without a cup that we've chosen, that without choosing God, even though we might be saved, we might be coming to church, without us actually choosing God back, it's very possible that we could get full of the things that he gives us, get full of his blessing. And once we're full, once we receive what we want from him, we leave and we go off and we do whatever we want until we feel empty again, until we feel depressed and we're tired of our lifestyle. We come back, we give it all again, and then we get full with his promises, and then we leave and we don't come back to church. And we go back out and we, you know, we feel bad. And so we come back to church and we get filled again. We raise our hands. We ask God to help us. And he does because he's so good. The Bible says that he's just to, to the wicked and to the good. He's, he gives rain to the, to the just and the unjust. He's good to all people. He's kind to all people. And so when we feel bad, we go in this cycle of getting filled with his promises. And we walk away and forget about God when we've got what we wanted from him. It's just, it's really sad. And the biggest, the, that's one of my biggest things is just making sure that my desires have been purified. And it's a constant process. I promise you that there's nobody here that never, ever desires something that God doesn't want them to have. You know, it's a, it's a deep-seated thing, and it takes a process of purification. So how do we get free from this trap? How do we purify our cup? How do we purify our desires? How do we empty our, our heart of all the old junk the, the, of the kingdom of darkness? How do we come in and change our desires that prayer isn't boring, so that reading the Bible isn't boring, so that coming to church isn't boring, that this is what we desire. These are the deep-seated desires of our heart. That's what God wants for us, and the answer of how to get free is one word, and that word is prayer. I know you're probably expecting it to be Thanksgiving, but I switched it on you. The recipe is prayer. That's, that's the word that we need to remember, and there's this really beautiful, beautiful verse 
of where it talks about how Jesus went up on a mountain and he prayed all night long. And when I think about that, I'm just like, man, I just, when you compare yourself to Jesus, you just feel like, man, I'm not doing anything. You know what I mean? How, you know, how, come on, Jesus. You don't sleep. You're tired. I know you are. He gets up in the middle of the night. He'll go out and pray on a mountain by himself. And his disciples wake up in the morning and wonder where he's at. He's still on a mountain praying. He does this all the time. And that word prayer, I did a, a study on this word prayer. It's, it's an incredible word. And it kind of gives us a deeper kind of revelation of what this word really means. In prayer, there's this exchange of desires. And one of the most commonly used words for prayer in the New Testament is this Greek word. And I don't, I should have put it on the screen just to see if anybody else could try to say it. But I'm going to try it. Okay. Prosuxomai. P-R-O-S-E-U-X-O-M-A-I. Sounds like just gibberish to me. But this is that Greek word that is so commonly translated for, as, as prayer in our New Testament. And this is what that word means. This is a very, very powerful word. It says this, to exchange wishes. To pray, to literally interact with the Lord by switching human desires for godly desires as he imparts faith. That's what this definition was. That this word for prayer is literally an exchange of desires. That we get in prayer and then we go before God. We, I just picture Jesus going there. And Jesus is perfect. Jesus had no sin and he participated in this one-on-one -on -one relationship with God where he was making sure that no matter what, he was giving God his desires and he received God's desires back down into his heart and he filtered everything through his, through his Father. Prayer was this exchanging of desires. And so if you ever find yourself struggling, if you ever find yourself wrestling against these desires, prayer is the secret. Because whether you're focusing on it or not, there's something about prayer where you're in prayer and you're communicating with God and you're speaking to Him and He's speaking to you and there's this interaction going on. Actually, part of this word, in, in this word, the, the prefix to this word is pros. And so that word actually means to lean in. It means that God is kind of leaning in and we're leaning in. But basically the Greek word, that Greek prefix, is denoting closeness. One, another definition that I read just defined it as face-to-face. -face. That's beautiful. And so when we get into this prayer, when we get along with him, we communicate with him. What happens in our hearts is the Holy Spirit begins to exchange. He begins to filter the things of our heart. He, we, we just have to be open. This, this is the easiest thing. He is the power to change our hearts. So he gives us this inheritance. And when we choose to give ourselves back to God, when we choose to give our hearts back to God as God has given his heart fully to us, when we choose him, what happens is that our hearts begin to go through this filtering purification process where our junk gets sifted away and we're left just a little bit more pure. We're left with just a little bit more pure desires. And I've got this kind of... Uh, object kind of less than this physical example. Thank you, Mr. Owen. I was going to have to take like three trips and it was going to be bad. Here we go. This is all going to be worth it, I promise. Thank you so much, Mr. Hunt. Now, back to business. Now, what this is going to represent, this is going to represent our desires. Ever say, my desires. And these desires are not pure. This is, this is all kinds of jacked up. It smells weird. It's different color. It's not pure. You guys can tell this is not pure water, right? I promise it's not Kool-Aid either, so don't get excited. Okay? My desires don't taste like Kool-Aid. I promise. So this is our desires, and, and, it's, and there's times where our desires look like this, and it's nothing like pure water. It looks nothing like God's desires for us. It looks nothing like this clear, crystal, beautiful, delicious water. It looks off-colored. It looks kind of weird. It looks kind of gross. But what happens is we begin to come, and this is God's desires, and this is all pure, and it's, and it's clean, and it's something that we would actually want to drink. And so here we are, and we pour... These are our desires, and this, is, this vase is our hearts, and so our hearts are filled with these impure desires, and we're kind of going through all this junk. And so what happens is, when we get into prayer, 
what God does is he comes in with his pure desires because that word means an exchange. And what's about to happen is an exchange from this container to that container. And so he begins to pour his desires out over us. And so what happens is it starts to filter through and you can tell that just after a little bit, it starts to get a little bit more clean. It starts to get a little bit more clear. It starts to get a little bit more pure. And what happens over time is we just begin to overflow. We get in prayer with our Father. He pours himself into us and we pour ourselves out for him. And pretty soon what happens is that our desires change and his desires are reflected in our hearts. And now we've got this purity and now we've got this clearness and now we've got this idea of our desires being totally purified. All that junk is gone and it's left in the grave where it belongs. And guess what? This is the place where our goal should be. This is the place where God wants us to be. This is the place where we can enjoy God. This is the place where his presence is all we want to be in. This is the place where that song that was talking about, that he keeps on getting better, that there's, there's nothing else we would actually rather have than him in our life. There's nothing we'd rather do than be in communication with him. What is better than communication with the God of the universe? What is better? And it's totally up to him. This is by his power. All we have to do is be here. All we have to do is present ourselves. And what he does is he pours his love over us and he soaks us with grace and he floods us with, with mercy and, and love and peace. And he floods himself as in his character and his desires over us. He floods over us and he washes us and we become pure and holy and clean. This is a beautiful process. And so our hearts are left looking exactly like the Lord's desires for us. And at this point, it's so much easier to live life with God when our desires are pure, when our desires are sacrificed. But it's not like you can just get with God sometimes and just expect it to all be done in one day. I've noticed this, and I was talking to Grace about this today, that there were some kids in our, in our kids' ministry that would come in, and they were just kind of off the wall, and they didn't pay attention, and they were just kind of didn't really care about, you know, the message that we were talking about. They didn't really care about the questions we were asking them. They didn't seem to care about God at all. And over the span of, a, of like two months, I noticed, especially this one kid, he jumps up whenever I ask for an opportunity for somebody to pray. And after he's prayed, I go around the circle to see if anybody else has anything they want to pray for. And this kid is just like, I want to pray again. T literally today, he jumps out of his chair and he trips over himself because he's that excited to pray. And what I'm witnessing in this child is that his desires are being purified. That I'm just, I'm witnessing this kid goes from, from darkness to light, from confusion and, and this ADD type of craziness over to this clarity and this excitement about prayer. And he's constantly asking, is anybody hurting? I want to pray for you. Does anybody have any pain in their bodies? I want to pray for you and see you get healed. I want to pray, I want to pray, I want to pray. And this is what God wants us to be like. He wants us to be like children. To, to, to come back to simplicity, to present ourselves to him and let him wash over us and let him do all the work, let him do the heavy lifting. The Bible says that we come to him all who are weary and heavy laden and burdened down by life and he will give us rest, that we follow him and we learn from him and he'll give us rest and peace in our souls. If I could have the worship team come up, that'd be awesome. It's just this beautiful process of purification that happens when we get one and one with God. I really believe tonight that God, as the Holy Spirit, will exchange our worldly desires for godly ones tonight. If we'll be willing, if we'll be open to it, if we'll open our hearts, we'll open our minds, I really believe that God wants to purify us tonight. That he wants to purge us of all the junk, that he wants to purge us of all this darkness. And the only way that darkness is expelled is by an overflow of light. And that's what he wants to do tonight. There's this part of this word, that, that word for prayer, that I want to say one more time, and it's, it's, it's a little bit of a different meaning. This is what it means in essence. It means to come face to face with God, to surrender your life in exchange for His, to surrender and, and exchange your desires in exchange for His desires with thanksgiving and with clarity in your heart, with sincerity in your heart. And so if everybody could just bow your heads and close your eyes, I want to ask just a question, and, and I, that question is some, one that I asked earlier, so I know that there's people out here that are, that are going to raise their hand because I'm raising my hand as well. If you're here tonight and you just know that you're wrestling with some desires, maybe prayer is boring for you. I know this isn't like this deep spiritual moment, but there's something just so practical about just getting real with God and about admitting our flaws and admitting our faults and admitting where we're falling short. If you really want a relationship with God, He's here tonight for you. Don't let Him pass you by. 
don't come to church and get filled with his presence and filled with his promise and filled with his love and then walk away and forget God. Don't let that, don't let that happen again. If you're here tonight, you want your heart to be washed over tonight in his presence. If you want your heart to be purified, for your desires to be purged of all those nasty things, to, become, to come into oneness with Jesus, like his will is for us. If you want that, I want you to raise your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. My hand is raised. So many hands. I'm just going to say a quick prayer for you, and then I'm going to ask one more question. But before I do, I just want to pray for everybody who has their hands raised. Just keep your hands up. If your shoulders start burning, just keep it low. <laughs> I know it's real. Lord Jesus, I just ask you right now in the name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would sweep through this room and change hearts, that you'd turn hearts from darkness to light, that you would exchange desires, Lord, that you would break off chains of addiction off of our lives in Jesus' name right now, that you would flood with your living water, that you'd flood with your purity and your love, that you'd flood with your holiness and change us from the inside out, change us and make us more like you. Give us the desire to pray. Give us the desire to be one with you, Lord Jesus. I ask that just as you wash over us, God, that you would come and do that today in this very room, that you would change hearts, that you would turn hearts towards you and away from sin and away from bondage and away from addiction. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. You can go ahead and put your hands down. There's just one more question I wanna ask and it's the most important question I could ever ask. And it's this, is that if you're in this place and you've never received the promise of salvation, you've never received Jesus into your heart, you've never asked him to forgive you of your sins, but you want to do that for the first time tonight, it's the most important decision you'll ever make. Because like I said, even though you might come to church and you receive from God and God has so many great things for you, just like the Israelites, they, they had all these things given to them, but they, they were ended up dying in the wilderness because their hearts weren't actually for the Lord. And if you're here tonight and you heard about this, what Jesus has done for you, I want you to raise your hand on the count of three if you want to receive Jesus into your heart as your Lord, as your Savior. If you want to give your control of your life over to Him and let Him purify you, let Him cleanse you of your sin. On the count of three, one, two, three. I see your hands. Awesome, awesome, awesome. You can go ahead and put them down. The Bible says to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved. Just repeat this prayer after me. And if everybody in this room could repeat this after me to support those that just raised their hand, that would be amazing. Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart, come into my life and change me. I'm tired of my ways. I'm tired of sin. I'm tired of life away from you. I want you. I need you. And I thank you for dying for me, even though I don't deserve it. I am not entitled to anything from you. But because of your love, you pour out over me grace and forgiveness. So I ask you to wash me, purify me, forgive me of all of my sin. I want to live like you. Help me and fill me with power. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we give these guys a, a huge round of applause? Awesome, awesome, awesome. We're just going to go for like four more minutes because we ran a little bit late, but we're going to go for a couple more minutes. If everybody could just stand your feet and come to the front, we're just going to sing this song just one more time. Just let whatever happened in your heart with the Lord just sink in. And if you need prayer for any reason of your life, for anything that you have need of in your life, we have a prayer team over here. Uh, Grace and Owen are here and they're gonna keep things discretionary. You know, they're gonna keep things secret. If there's anything you need prayer for, I encourage you, go receive prayer. Let's worship Jesus, come on. I just want you 